the material that we covered so far, okay? Including Pixar, chapter one to three, okay? So I won't be starting the business level strategies yet. And uh, one other thing, because I want you to think about this and maybe we'll do a poll if you want to. But on the 25th, uh, I let my other class take a break uh, because they are working on some projects already. If you want me to take 25th off and make an async uh, kind of work instead, I can consider it. That's just right before the uh, spring recess. So if, I mean, I'll do the poll, but if, if many of you say, let's take the 25th as a sync class, I will do it, okay? Let's think about it and I will, I will make changes in the schedule, okay? Any questions? Perfect. Now let's, uh, we, let's not lose time because we have a lot to cover with the Lime case. And I am, as usual, I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction. Uh, for example, I'm sure many of you use Uber or Lyft. And I'm wondering if how many of you had witnessed or have seen uh, Lyft bikes or scooters around your area. Is it something that you see a lot or is it something that you're not really used to? I don't see it in my area. You don't? No. Okay. Anybody? Yes, Jason? There are a lot of uh, rules in like New York City about that kind of stuff, but I was just in St. Louis and there are lifts, I mean, not lifts, uh, like limes and birds everywhere and just other types mm -hmm. of electric scooters in Europe also, a ton of them. Uh, Gabriela? I know we talked about it previously in another class, but there's like that Revel brand. There's like electric scooters now in the city where people can rent electric scooters, kind of like mopeds with like helmets and you can ride around. But that's like the only electric scooter mm -hmm. other than like city bike, which right. is electric, but. Yeah, uh, Jarna, did you wanna say something? No, I was just gonna mention uh, Revel and um, they definitely had some like hiccups in the beginning of like uh, safety and they actually made it so you can't unlock the bike or you can't unlock the little scooter and start until you've taken like a selfie with your helmet on obviously you mm -hmm. can take it off but I guess that sort of like clears them of some sort of like liability um yeah that was all I was gonna say uh Claudia thank you Jana to Claudia I think I see a lot of electric scooters especially on like campuses and um like school grounds so a lot of college students use it <laughs> and how many of you have ridden like, did you, did you ride on these at all? Anybody has any experience with, is a rider, a bar? Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, it's been in my hometown in Tel Aviv, uh, you use it as the most uh, uh, popular transportation mode. People use it to go to work, people use it for everything. And absolutely in big cities where a lot of cars and traffic is a big issue, this is the most convenient solution. Yes, and absolutely. So, uh, and I agree that this is a good solution, not only from the environmental, and I think it's a big thing, environmental issue, um, because of the emission gas, you know, it's killing our planet, uh, carbon emissions. And also it's feasible because sometimes you know, with cars, especially in New York City or places where it's very hard to park or find a parking lot, this is a great thing. And also it helps people to stay in shape, especially for people like me over 40 years old. Staying in shape is a huge issue, guys. Your metabolism goes down when you're over 40 years old and walking is not enough anymore and you do you don't we don't want to feel if you want to run or something it's just so hard really to keep shape and i think it's a good alternative i would love to ride one of those um, also to let's say small grocery shopping and things like that and i don't want to use the car all the time i absolutely agree anybody else have any experience with this Okay, so, and there's a big issue about vandalism, 
abandonment of the bike. So we're gonna look at that. But let me give you, uh, uh, and let me stop share, I'll share again. Let me also, I found some videos, maybe you've seen them before, maybe not, but I think these are nice, uh, like short videos about uh, Lyme uh, and the idea about e-bikes. Uh, let me know if you can hear the sound. Okay, I'm going to share these. This is another one. It's usually firms like Uber, Tesla and Google who take home the headlines surrounding electric vehicles, and rightly so, given the impact these companies are having on the mobility industry. But what's overlooked is the role played by single rider, two wheeled vehicles like scooters and bikes that can be cheaper and remarkably more efficient, especially in dense urban areas. So how is Lime looking to change the public perception of personal vehicles? How has the company fared during its short lifespan and how might last mile transportation look in just a few years time. Here's how it happened. Lime Bike, as it was originally known, was only founded in 2017 by two executives from Chinese firm Fosun International, Brad Bao and Toby Sun. They managed to raise $12 million in capital almost immediately and launched their first service at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. 125 bikes were made available, and unlike some of its rivals in other cities, such as Santander Cycles in London and City Bike in New York, these bikes didn't need to be returned to a docking station, thanks to their built-in GPS signal that alerted the company to its location at all times. The bikes cost $1 per 30-minute block, and were the first publicly available dockless bikes in the United States. They were even custom designed so that parts like wheels and saddles couldn't be used on any other model of bicycle as a deterrent to potential thieves. Throughout the summer of 2017, Limebike was launched in cities across the states of California, Florida, Indiana and Washington and received a valuation of $225 million in October of the year of its release, by which time the service had an estimated customer base of 150,000 users. Limebike was made available across Germany and Switzerland in December, and at the start of 2018, a trial of a new electric model was announced in San Francisco. Known as Lime E, the rental was charged at $1 plus one additional dollar for every 10 minutes of riding time. These bikes carried a small motor just above the rear wheel and offered top speeds of up to 15 miles per hour and a range of 62 miles. 
Following the bike's positive reception, they were then made available in their other operational cities up and down the country. And in May, Lime Bike released a completely new concept, the Lime S electric scooter. The S also stood for Segway, who became partners in the production process and provided a much more robust scooter compared to those available to purchase on the consumer market. The scooters cost $1 to unlock and then just 10 cents per minute of your journey, meaning a short trip of a couple of miles could come in at under $2. This period marked a pivot in Limebike's strategy, and with the new image came a new name. The company became known simply as Lime, and represented their wider range of mobility offerings. They even changed their URL, making clever use of the domain .me to form their new website. Sadly for Lime, the sudden emergence of their scooters blocking the San Franciscan streets was not welcomed by locals, who also had to endure the launch of rivals like Bird, Scoot, Skip and Spin. After receiving over a thousand complaints in the space of just one month, Lime and its competitors were banned from operating in San Francisco. But this didn't stop Lime from expanding its service elsewhere, with its bikes reaching a host of European cities throughout 2018, including Barcelona, London and Paris. It was also at this stage that the company struck a partnership with Uber, which meant their e-scooters would become available on the ride-hailing app for American customers. Lime had now received a valuation of $2.4 billion, following a few more funding rounds, and there seemed to be no stopping the firm from taking over our roads. But it's not all been plain sailing for Lime. The company reportedly lost more than $300 million over the course of 2019, in part due to the depreciation of their vehicles, extensive repair costs, and a surprisingly sharp fall in membership during the winter months. One of the sticking points, especially in Europe, has been regulation, with a wave of new laws coming in during the last few years to accommodate the new technology. For example, electric scooters were entirely banned in London until a law change in 2020, while recent legislation has seen scooters prohibited from footpaths, highways and rural roads of France, and in Madrid, the two wheelers cannot be used in any pedestrianised area, and a helmet must be worn, or users could face a €200 Euro fine. Lime also made a loss during its brief spell in the car sharing industry, through a venture called LimePod. The pilot programme lasted less than a year in the city of Seattle, and saw the company withdraw its 50-strong fleet of all-electric Fiat 500s from operation. But Lime continues to expand, despite the challenges that the last 12 months have posed. The firm has acquired Uber's e-bike division, Jump, and unveiled its newest Lime Gen 4 scooter. Lime stated in November 2020 that it had recorded its first profitable quarter, becoming the first new mobility company to achieve such a feat. Only time will tell whether Lime can carve out its own distinct niche in the transportation industry, or if its bikes and scooters will endure the same fate as the infamous Segway. And that's how it happened. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe, and thanks for watching. Okay, so this is a little bit of a story uh, that they have. Um, any comments, questions on that? Pretty, pretty much clear where they are headed. And it seemed to be quite visionary uh, with the founders from San Mateo. It's interesting that I was there at the same time. Um, I spent majority of time in 2017 in Palo Alto. If you see my in bio, I've, I did some boot camps there with with some entrepreneurs, and I was very close to where they are. San Mateo, if you haven't visited, it's a very nice town. Although, you know, the area, San Francisco Bay Area and all that is very high real estate. Uh, so, I mean, it's very expensive. That's what I mean. So a lot of people are actually moving out to Seattle or some employees are deciding to work from other places, some companies did move their um, for a headquarters to Texas. Uh, Austin has been one of the uh, popular places. So again, I mean, anyway, so that, that's interesting that they were there. And I, I felt that kind of thing uh, uh, back, back, it was really different. Anyway, so uh, here now we have, uh, you know, Lime's kind of position where they are trying to be uh, a bike sharing e-bike and they started to do the mopeds as well. 
And it's it's mainly working with a simple idea. You just you don't need a docking station, so that's their main value proposition. And the cost is very little for people who just need an immediate bike. So it kind of removes the hassles associated with renting any kind of transportation device, and they make it easy for people to rent, to find, and to actually go. Out, okay, so. What business is Lyman? So think about that. Anybody wants to share what businesses get businesses Lyman? Okay, let's wait on that then. What appears to be the mission, vision, and values? And somebody wrote something in the chat. Transportation. Okay, so on a general kind of look, yes. Uh, that's transportation. Um, so let's move, but we will we will talk some more. Influence of the industry forces on the lines business model. Uh, so we will study that. We will do that. I'm going to ask you about the strength of the forces around Lime, uh, and does Lime appear to be able to outperform rivals by establishing a difference that it can preserve? So remember. Do you remember the VRIM framework? What is the VRIM framework? Let me talk about VRIM for a company. Question number three is the most important. Anybody wants to say, Jocelyn? Um, just valuable, rare, uh, I think imitable and then non sustainable. Inimitable. Inimitable, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Inimitable, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, again, uh, strategic, strategic management concept. So what we do, analyze, formulate, and implement, right? So when we look at the strategic management angle, you talk about the balance between, the trade-off between efficiency and effectiveness, right? And you already know these terms, so I'm assuming you all know that. And needs to incorporate short and long term perspective. So, meaning we are looking at it not only in terms of short term profitability or short term uh, gains and brand value, but we also look at it in the long term. And the, the remember the term that we were using for that was ambidextrous, right? So, the firm being able to use both the left and the right hand uh, at, the, uh, at the same time. Okay, so what business is Lyman? What is Lyman's mission, vision, values? And so urban, so specifically, particularly, okay, in general is transportation, but if we want to make it a little bit more, uh, let's say specific, we could say urban, short distance, personal transportation. Obviously with the bike, you can't just go to California from New Jersey. I mean, it's, I mean, people do that, but it's not something that a lot of people would do, right? So it's short distance. Uh, what is the app? Does anybody remember in, in Manhattan, people were using mostly? Anybody remember that? Oh. City bike? No, not the bike. For Uber? Else. No, for like short distances. Uber's app? For short, very short distances, like the last mile. People were people were using that a lot, but I don't know if their situation today. It's like a it's like it's a carpooling system. Huh? To it's like carpooling. Anybody yeah. remembers what it was? Yeah. It's VIA. It's VIA. It's VIA app. Remember, VIA is like there is a lot, many people. They don't take you from door to door, but what they do is they help you around, like with short distances, and especially in Manhattan. I don't know where else they are, but I know they are in Manhattan. But right now, because of the COVID, they might have suffered. I don't really specifically look at VIA's situation, but yes. So VIA uh, was another alternative. Uh, and again, uh, it was used for similar reasons. Sometimes they say the last mile, or sometimes they say uh, short distances like grocery shopping. You don't feel like walking, but you want to pass come back and forth. Or let's say you want to take the just bike and the just go for like a little trip around someplace, but which is short. It's not something that requires you to travel miles and miles, okay? So short distance transportation 
uh, what we're talking about here. And okay, so they believe that all communities deserve access to smart, affordable mobility, right? So smart and affordable. And they believe e-bikes will prefer our classic bikes and liters could for longer distances. Again, this doesn't mean long, long distance, but again, you know, with regular bikes, you need to spend more effort. So with e-bikes, I haven't used any of those. Uh, I've used classic bikes, but not e-bikes, but I think they are easier to use. And maybe Bar would like to share with us later um, and had a goal of eliminating the docking station. So they found out that through the experience with city bikes, which is very more common in New York City, that docking bikes is a problem for people, right? And, and also making it more affordable. They, they did it, they did change with the price component and also the affordable, the, the access components, right? So they are playing with two different things in their value chain, which brings them a value proposition, okay? And they want to save cities, the municipalities, money, and they wanted to help conserve the environment. What kind of vision did they have? Well, Lime was to become the default short trip on demand service for getting people around cities. And they had this kind of thing about being a good neighbor. So they called themselves good neighbor. And they wanted to take care of vandalized, discarded scooters. Uh, and they wanted to respond to the complaints. So they wanted to be responsive. And they wanted to partner with municipalities, right, uh, about transportation options and everything. And they wanted to give the residents in the urban areas a cost-effective transportation choice. And as I said earlier, environmental impact of the service was very important. So when you think about the major stakeholders for Lyme, we see municipalities and local communities. They are their key stakeholders. They may not necessarily be direct customers, uh, but they are important parts of their business because they need their partnership to really do good business, okay, around the city. Anybody wants to, wants to add to this? Perfect, okay. Uh, okay, well, we will find out about this later on, but their uh, business strategy is more like differentiation. We'll talk about this some more, but the main question we wanna ask guys, and I want you to think about this in your teams, how can Lime create a sustainable competitive advantage in the marketplace that is not only unique and valuable, but also difficult for competitors to copy or substitute? So please keep this in mind individually and as a team, you'll be working with this question. What are some of the environmental forces? And I wanna ask question here. So. Um, so as you could see, we have technological forces, we have economic forces, and I'm going to get to five forces very shortly. We have global forces, we have demographic, sociocultural, political reasons. Which of these factors do you think work or work for or against line? Anybody wants to say anything to this? There is no absolute right or wrong. Again, let me remind you. So please answer according to your own analysis of line situation. Uh, so which forces do you think? Uh, Kevin? Yeah, just um, just to note the big um, political, I guess, legal issue that they're facing is the, you know, cities don't want them around because of all the mess that they put on the street uh, with all the scooters all over the place. Um, so that's something that they either have to fix um, mm -hmm. or try to find an innovative way to go around it. Okay, so it's sometimes you say work against them, this force, legal forces. Yeah, legal forces will work against them. I mean, unless they find some way to get around it. Okay, I see. Okay, Diana? I think demographic also plays a big role and the cultural, sociocultural, because um, in some cultures, it's not so common to use bikes mm -hmm. and uh, the, the general public is not so used to it. Like, let's say, in China and India and Japan, it's very common to use bikes for transportation. But in America, I do see it sometimes, but not as often. And then also I think environment itself plays a big role because in a place like New York where the weather is always so bad, 
uh, lime is a disadvantage because first of all, the bikes are gonna rust if they stay outside. And second of all, like who wants to ride a bike in bad weather? Mm -hmm. That's why they, they, New York is not their main, you know, target cities, I believe. Uh, yeah, Chris, exactly. Thank you, Diana, yes. Chris? Um, well, Diana said pretty much what I wanted to say. Okay, okay. So anybody else wants to add to this? Those are really good inputs, really. Uh, some of the factors here work for or against uh, uh, Lyme's success, okay? And again, like when you look at the external environment, you see that political legal related to regulations, as you mentioned, of the municipalities and legal regulations, sociocultural, well, uh, some people though, on a positive note, some people, especially young people like you, they don't wanna own cars. I don't know any of you don't want to own cars here. Anybody don't prefer owning cars at all? Okay, okay. Sorry, what was the question? So anybody want, okay, Christopher says, I don't want a car, I, I wanna have a car. Okay, uh, so anybody who wants to own a car versus who doesn't want to own a car? Because the new cultural, sociocultural forces say that some of the younger generation, they don't want to have a car. I'm asking if any of you, Mariah? Do you mean like own or lease? Because like I prefer not to own it, but I prefer leasing cars. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. So I'm just asking not the way of owning it in terms of lease or anything, but in my lifetime, they say, I don't want to have a car. That's that kind of thing. Okay. I'm raising the chat. Okay, good. Uh, so any of you, Ajarna, please. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to own a car in New York City. Even when I've had one there for a couple of days, it's so miserable, like, finding parking dealing with like the opposite side of the street parking and street cleaning and and just the hours and when you can and can't and like you have to pick up so early to move the car it's just honestly not worth the it's not worth the the benefits like the the cons are not equal with the pros mariah did you want to say something Sorry, I had my hand up from last time. Okay, no problem. Stiffy, go ahead. Um, the uh, points that, uh, was it Jarna just made? Uh -huh. Yeah, those seem like good things that um, the self-driving car could capitalize on. Because if you have to wake up in the morning, you could just set an auto, I don't know, auto repark or whatever, and it just drives to like a different spot and parks instead of you getting up and going outside. It's funny you think there are many parking spots available. <laughs> right, see, that's the other thing, because like where I live too, like after like 7.30, that's it, forget it. You might as well just park in another neighborhood because you have no parking out here and you're going to be like wasting a tank of gas driving around in circles. Especially with COVID and having like permits for restaurants to be able to take up street area of what already was a few amount of parking spaces, that was especially horrible. Yeah, not already gives me anxiety having dinner in the middle of the street. But you know, guys, some other countries they don't have those strict guidelines for parking. So if you wanna, if you happen to live in some other countries apart from the United States, you might like driving a car, really, <laughs> because not every country has a similar issue with parking. But in here. Even though you might leave a place smaller than New York City, you always have some, some kind of regulation with parking. It's just, I don't know. Uh, it's the way the society and culture is, I guess. Everything has to be paid. You, you, there is nothing free, really. So <laughs> the parking is limited on most of the areas. It's very restricted. And New York is crazy. I know I witnessed it for several times myself. And I'm glad as a Baruch professor, I have some place that I can use for some alternative, you know, prices for Baruch students and faculty uh, in New York City. <laughs> and that was a good one. But again, it's not cheap. It's just less price. Uh, it's, it's never cheap. So um, 
again, you know, this thing is crazy and I could understand and relate to it. Yes, exactly. There's nothing really free here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, professor, I don't know, uh, actually, to, to everyone in general, I don't know if you guys saw like the news report like a few months ago, there was like a parking issue in Flushing, where two two guys were fighting for a parking spot, and one of them just kind of drove into a store and he chose to park in, in the building that was occupied with people and furniture. Wow. Interesting. I haven't heard about that. Yeah, I mean, this is how then there is um, a limited resource in any kind of place, and it could be food, it could be place, it could be territory, there's always some kind of fight or aggression. No wonder why people in New York could be aggressive sometimes, because it's just there's everything, there's the understanding of lack, it's always this lack, lack of time, lack of space, lack of money. So that kind of lack creates aggressiveness not only in humans, but also animals. They did tons of experiments and research with animals having limited access to resources and they became aggressive. So anyway, if you happen to live in some other place in your lifetime, enjoy uh, you know, parking freely in some places that you know, it's, it's really particularly for countries and the culture that you, you're at. Um, thank you, Steffi, for, those, for sharing those, that's nice. So and, uh, I provided a link in the in the chat if anyone wants to see that. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, and economic. So price wars. So there is always this kind of you know fight between the companies for lower prices. And yes, you know they were able to take advantage of this and they were able to leverage that kind of pricing, uh, which is cheap uh, and global. Meaning, like some, uh, they mentioned Barcelona, for example, London, and some other cities. Dockless bike was something of preference. And I don't know if you've been to Europe before, guys, but in Europe, bike riding is very common in the culture. So a lot of people in Europe, they just bike. Uh, in Germany, it's very common. In Holland, I mean, you see so many people biking. And I know a friend of mine, uh, she lives in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And she works in the, this big, big company called Maersk. That's a, a shipment logistics company, very big company. And she just bikes to work. Uh, and that's how everybody does in her area. So that's something that they could they took advantage of in Europe, especially. Technological, well, you know, similar to Uber and Lyft. They were able to take advantage of creating just a simple app. And app formation is, you know, it's not that complicated anymore. People can create apps and it made it easy for them to replicate some of the value chain that Uber and Lyft use for the same idea for, for, for bike riding. Um, and again, the invention of these smaller efficient batteries made it possible you know, to work for, like it, it made it possible you know, for people to ride it as much as they could, okay? So, what business is lying in? Urban short distance personal transformation. What is the industry to be analyzed? Bike sharing, e-scooter market. Okay, so now I want to ask you, uh, how do you think about the uh, forces? Anybody would like to tell me, for example, in, in, uh, in Lime's case, what is the strength of the power of buyers? Strength of the power of suppliers and others. Kevin, please go ahead. Yeah, I can start off with the um, power of buyers. Uh, power of buyers, they're able to go to different options. There's a lot of competitors in the field, uh, which I think some other people will touch upon for the other forces. Uh -huh. um, and there's also different transportation opportunities. Like you, know, you can take a subway, you can take a car, you can go walking. Generally uh -huh. speaking, I don't need a scooter if Substitutes. I just need yeah. Substitutes are very much available. Uh -huh. Right. So, Jason? oh, sorry. Go oh, no, no, that's it. No, that's it. Yeah. Sorry. Jason, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's it called? The, uh, did, you, did you want one specifically for buyers and suppliers, or can we go on the other forces? Whatever, like those five forces, whichever you want to tackle, you can take any of these. I mean, probably um, rivals mm -hmm. and uh, 
yeah, I mean, that's probably the biggest one. I think uh, on one of the videos you showed it said that China, or I think actually it was in the case that China had 65 different companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, plus the already like large um, companies that exist like Uber and Lyft that could potentially uh, just, you know, basically dwarf these by creating their own service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jason, thank you. I thought there was a guy staring behind you and I think it's just a picture, right? Oh, yeah, that's my friend. I'm just kidding you. Okay, Jarna? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna talk about um, rivals and threat of new entrants kind of like together. It seems that there are quite a lot of new entrants and quite a lot of competitors, but mm -hmm. that they don't necessarily last very long because of mm -hmm. sort of like, theft mm -hmm. and regulations and mm -hmm. um, just like a lot of other factors. So although it seems like mm -hmm. it's easy for a lot of companies that may be mm -hmm. doing something similar already to like get in the game, it's kind of hard mm -hmm. to stay. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously like um, Kevin was saying a lot of substitutes and you have a lot of options like New York City, you know, if this, you can check if the subways are down, you can hop in a cab. And if the cabs are, you know, not around or the lifts or the, like there's so many different options. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. Anybody else who hasn't had the chance to talk? Uh, especially this term, I mean, you know, I, I, I pretty like to give you participation points and I usually give extra, extra to those who have been participating very constantly. Uh, and I was, I'm seeing already five to 10 people already doing so far and they will probably get a lot of extra credits as well. So I just want to encourage you guys to please go ahead and you know, tell us whatever you think. And as I always say, there is no right or wrong in any of this. The industry experts have some idea about the forces, but again, you can put your own analysis and your own evidences as long as it's fact-based, acceptable. So no worries. Anybody else who wants to, uh, you know, jump in to talk about you know the five forces. Um, All right, now uh, let me share. So here, what you could see here is, uh, although we mentioned uh, there are uh, a lot of substitutes available, the industry experts, they think rivalry is more of a problem rather than the substitutes. Because uh, usually, um, they say there is no one-on-one -on -one match with a bike. That's what they think. So cars or cabs or taxis, they don't see them as a real substitute. So they see it mostly, you know, uh, like traditional bicycles, they see it as a substitute. So it's a little bit one-on-one -on -one analysis and you might agree or disagree with that. And I'm gonna listen to you. I'm sure some of you disagree with that, but that's the understanding. Buyer's power has been found to be very low because you know, usually in this kind of thing, they believe uh, the consumers really don't have too many options to bargain the price. And usually the supplier power is also very low where they believe there are so many suppliers supplying bike. It's not like space shuttle or it's not like electric cars. Lots of people can do this. And then new entrance, as I think Jana mentioned this, lot very high so people are easily entering into this industry because low cost of startups especially the low cost of startups and then rivalry again uh, it's just the it's, if you look at bird jump or uh, let's say line people don't see much of it i mean it's just an e-bike and it's 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 a replicable business model so that's why Rivalry and threat of entrance has been found to be very high. Anybody wants to argue against against us? Anybody? And let me. Can you let me? Okay, sure. I'll 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 make it bigger for you. Uh, uh, Jana, please go ahead. I actually had sort of a, a different question, but you can tell me not to ask that now, but I, I just, something I haven't heard about is city bike having the same amount of thefts as Lyme. And I was just wondering if you know anything about um, thefts for city bikes. 
thefts, like stealing. Uh huh. Thefts, like thefts. thefts. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's is it is I because I mean I may not speak to that really well because I don't know how easy it is to steal a city bike versus a line bike. Because line bike is not sometimes attached to a docking system. I think it's yeah. it's easier. It should be easier with e bike. But you're saying they are similar. Yeah, but also I know they were saying in that video that um, line bikes have you know, uh, pieces that can't be applied to other bikes, but it's not like, I wouldn't, I don't know. I, if, if someone's, I don't know if people would know that and steal it anyway, and then find that out later when they were trying to maybe apply it to a different bike. Like, I don't like, is that common knowledge of that? Those pieces can't be interchangeable. Uh, again, I mean, let's discuss this also. This is a good question in the value chain discussion. This is mostly related to the technology that they use, the resources that they use. And maybe that's very specific. And I know they are highly innovative in the kind of bikes that they do. But still, people find that it's usually replicable. Jahir? So I just wanted to say, um... I don't think the threat of entrepreneurs is high because mm -hmm. um, I think companies will realize that this uh, industry is like could get oversaturated very easily and mm -hmm. they might not want to um, compete in this market. On top of that, mm -hmm. I think a lot of individuals could just go out there and buy their own bike. And so that's why I just don't feel like. Okay, I like, see. Maybe you, you believe that it might be moderate, not high because that's short lived. The threat of new entrants will be high for a while, but then it's gonna go away because it's going to be the saturated market. Okay, I get you. I get your point. I'm gonna get to the chat very quick, but before I do that, I'm gonna put you into groups, guys. I'm gonna show you what I need to you to do. Okay, so remember the the 